Yes, sir. Good. All right. All right, so again, uh, as they, uh, Steve and Bob alluded, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about how we manage our volunteers and kind of some things that we do, kind of how it got started and kind of where we are now and where we plan on being in the future. So with that being said, um, our overview for today, first of all, who is SCEMD? Well, I'll talk a little bit about that. And we're doing things slightly different in South Carolina. Uh, some states have adopted just an OXCOM model exclusive. Um, we, we do both ARIES and OXCOM, or OXC as uh, CISA likes to call it now. Um, and I will explain the differences here uh, as we proceed. Uh, talk a little bit about how we utilize the volunteers and then uh, hit on some of the training requirements um, that we have. And before I move any further, I'll say the South Carolina Emergency Management Division, we are a division of the Adjutant General or the uh, Military Department of South Carolina. And uh, we do have primary role in the state for natural disasters and uh, coordination and all of those good things that have to take place. Um, so that's just who we are. And uh, we have partnered with ESF2 and, and the SWIC and others to uh, build these these programs and uh, work together and I've told Roger I've told Bob and others uh, many times uh, I'm glad to be a small part of the team that is getting this done uh, I, I feel honored to be a part of that and uh, glad that I came along when I did all right also want to talk a little bit about who our communications partners are in the state uh, obviously you have us uh, ESF2 which in our state is uh, led by the Department of Administration. And then they have support agencies underneath them that support them, and we're one of those. Um, we also have the uh, SLED, the SWIC. Um, as Bob said, the SLED stands for South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. Uh, we have ETV, our educational television part. And you'll see here in a minute why they're kind of important in our communications system here in the state. The State Guard, uh, they, they're important. They provide a lot of resources and a lot of capability to us. And we have ARIES, RACES, and OPSCOM. So those are some of the partners, and there's many others, uh, but there, if I would take up eight slides just to list them all. So I kind of hit the key ones, the uh, big ones that really play a huge role in it. I also want to mention Civil Air Patrol. I should have added them them to this slide, but Civil Air Patrol is a huge partner too. Um, they bring a lot to the table. They especially uh, bring a lot when it comes to airborne assets for flying repeaters during some of our bigger events and things like that. Where do we start? Well, like a lot of other states, everybody has a starting point and we started off relatively uh, mundane, just Aries, races. Um, didn't have a lot of other things going on. And at the time, uh, that program was all by itself. And at the time, there wasn't as much support and partnerships coming from other uh, places in the state. Then SC Hart came along. And uh, as Steve uh, mentioned, SC Hart stands for South Carolina Healthcare Emergency Amateur Radio Team. And we're gonna talk more about that here in a little bit, uh, but that's kind of part of that starting. Then Agency Mars uh, slash share, shares, and then now uh, Oxcom. So those are kind of where we started. Those are the kind of things that happened uh, early on. So what's the SC Heart program? The SC Heart program started in 2006 and it was the vision of John Crockett, who was the vice president of engineering at ETV at the time. And uh, Roger did a pretty good talk about him last week. Uh, uh, John was an amazing guy and uh, was one of the pioneers of amateur radio uh, in the state of South Carolina. He was a, uh, a friend of everybody. Uh, John never met a stranger. And uh, he really wanted to use his position at ETV to help make a difference in amateur radio and how we conduct business. 
So 2006, they got together, him and some other hams. They started brainchilding and talking. And all of a sudden, the SC Heart Program became a reality. And it was funded through grants that DHEC made uh, our Department of Health. Uh, they, they did grants through the Hospital Association and in support of the Hospital Association to help pay for some of the initial equipment. What was really interesting about this program, all of these repeaters were built on state-owned infrastructure using state-owned microwave, our state-owned microwave network. These sites have generators, backup batteries, all sorts of uh, redundancies. So not only is this system a uh, really neat system to have, it's supported by the state. It, it has state infrastructure and it has backup generators to uh, ensure that it runs. Also, when they put the system in, um, they, they decided that we'd do something a little different. So the system is actually, in its early days, it was two separate systems. It was two separate analog systems that were, one side was VHF, one side was UHF. And that remains today as the way that it's structured. Uh, we have uh, two bridges. Actually, we have, I think, a third one. Um, as a backup, but there's two main bridges and you can actually link these independent of each other, meaning you can have two complete statewide networks uh, simultaneously. Uh, we'll talk a little more about how we use that current configuration uh, current in current times here later. Then in 2014, uh, uh, Roger, John, and some others decided to try DMR, digital, and then that system came about. And again, thanks to some grants, uh, some that were funded through DHS and other uh, places, that system is also now statewide and is co-located at those same sites. The DMR system provides a third system. So now uh, we're, we're in pretty good shape. We have three uh, unique separate systems that we can use. Um, and of course, during the emergency, those repeaters, uh, they're configured and controlled by the radio room at EMD um, in conjunction with ETV. Also, so I also want to point out the heart program is not just a repeater network. The SC Heart program also includes radio response teams. These support DHEC for hospitals um, and other areas. They do weekly training nets, both for the healthcare side of the house and Aries and Races, and I want to back up and point out the the SC Heart Network was originally established to do the hospitals. That was its original mission. Aries and Opscom kind of came along a little later in, in the game. So um, the current day, we actually can split the system up, and our, our current plans call for utilizing the VHF system to support the counties and the UHF system to support the hospitals. Most hospitals have a radio room with equipment on site, and most of them actually have their members go there weekly um, and do those nets from there. Uh, that's not been happening as quite as much, obviously, with COVID here in the lab. But generally speaking, they do try to go to the hospitals and complete those nets. Uh, they do an Aries net as well weekly uh, on the uh, system, and that's held on Sunday night and the uh, healthcare nets on Thursday. There's a training and development team, and that training and development team works closely with ETV to offer training incentives. Uh, they also do monthly and quarterly uh, ham radio training sessions, as well as testing sessions for folks willing to get their license. Um, and that program, I'll tell you, has grown significantly over the last few years. And the fact that when it started, they might have done them twice a year and they were three-day classes. Now they do them several times. Uh, I think it, uh, I don't know if it's monthly, but I know it's at least every two months. And they do four, five and four-day classes with testing sessions on Saturday. So that, that system, that, that training part has really uh, exploded and expanded in the last several years. It's important to note too, volunteers, are the ones that usually assist in the maintenance and management of the network. 
there are times where ETV actually sends folks out to help, but usually it's volunteers such as Roger um, and others, uh, Gary Leonard, uh, Cliff Con many others that go and donate their time to help keep this network uh, going. SC Heart also maintains a mobile communications trailer. That trailer is uh, loaded down with amateur radio, state radio equipment, uh, as well as a DMR repeater that can be uh, fired up and put on the network through the satellite. Um, they also maintain four uh, amateur radio shares kits. Those kits come com complete with Winlink and some other uh, cool stuff. Uh, all of those kits come complete with masts, antennas, coax, generator, everything ready to go. Um, some of the volunteers also operate the public facing website through the program. And there's also a nonprofit uh, segment that uh, called the SE Heart Foundation that uh, helps support and maintain the system. So those are some things that the SE Heart program has grown into and uh, Early on, it was really just a repeater network, but since it has really morphed into a whole lot more than that. And I will be the first to tell you this program uh, is one of the best things that's happened to this state in a long time as far as uh, redundant communications, uh, because the program also works with ESF2, they work with the SWIC, they work with us. Uh, it's just, it's a great program. It's, it's, uh, it's done a lot over the years. All right, so after the SC Heart Network kind of came on and started uh, taking off, in 2009, South Carolina also went and started using agency marketing. I want to take a second and kind of explain how we did that, kind of some things that went through the selection process of Mars and uh, hit on some of those key notes. Mars was selected primarily because of data through Winlink, and actually we used Mars all the way through 2018. But why did we choose Mars? Well, the state recognized that data communications was, was becoming a priority, and we needed the ability to send secure messages. We needed an ability to have dedicated frequencies and pass automatic data. Um, we tried some of the ham frequencies, but the issues are there. Uh, there are several issues there uh, with using ham. One of them is you don't have a dedicated calling frequency uh, to use, both for voice or data. And the issue you run into, and I'll add to you on that, every time we do an activation or an exercise, we publish HF frequencies in advance to put in the exercise plan. And I can tell you that nine times out of 10, the day we do the exercise or the activation, when you go to that channel, somebody is on there either contesting or rag chewing. So that's been kind of an issue for us um, using HF on the amateur side. Mars, Agency Mars allowed us to have dedicated frequencies that were designed specifically for data and specifically for voice. So. We didn't have to worry about that no more. So that's kind of one of the things, not only, not only that, you'll see my last bullet point there. There's a lot of restrictions under part 97 that adversely affect speed and uh, uh, stuff like that too, uh, as far as sending data. So Mars was a solution and we went with it. And honestly, uh, oddly enough, the way we got into Mars was in 2009 at Dayton, John and uh, Roger ran into Steve Waterman. Uh, Steve started talking to them about Winley Agency Mars, and at the same time, the South Carolina Strategic Planning co uh, was underway to uh, identify and had identified data as being a significant need. That had happened previous. So we had already talked about data, and then they run in Steve at Dayton, and Steve started talking about it, and one thing led to another, and voila, here we are. We're, we're using Mars. So that was a little bit of a background on why we went to Mars. Well, now let's talk about the third bullet. Why did we use 
we're going to talk about that in the HHS share system. And one of the reasons for that was Mar uh, Agency Mars was kind of consolidating operations and uh, Air Force wanted to kind of transition some of the non-military members over to the DHS side of the house. So we went and did that. And in fairly quick order, we had all of our RMS stations and deployable assets converted and reconfigured. Shares is just like Agency Mars. It provides dedicated voice and data channels. And to this day, we still use shares. That's where we are. How do we use shares? Well, we use WinLink, obviously. And we have used that during all the activations and exercises we've done since 2018. We also have, uh, we have one state, uh, one station in the state that participates in weekly voice nets. And that station also sends monthly reports to FEMA region four. Um, that was an initiative that Steve started several months back to try to get states to send reports, spot reports to the watch centers and kind of working through that uh, process. That seems to work out really well. We also, in addition, operate three servers. These servers are also at ETB sites and they are on the air 24 seven. And I mentioned those four kits earlier, all four of those kits are shares capable. So all of these slides are in chronological order and how we progressed through this process. So after we went and, and went over to uh, Mars in 2012, South Carolina adopted the Oxcom model. That Oxcom model transitioned all of the uh, training bridge over to management for under SCE and D. And we set some training standards. Those training standards we'll talk about a little bit, but those training standards required ICS training for the SEAC volunteers, as well as the operators that went out with things such as the SC heart trailer or the flyaway kits. Also at that time, established was a monthly coordination meeting that uh, was all volunteer ran, and those meetings coordinated with State Guard, ARIES, uh, Civil Air Patrol, uh, MARS, and RACES. Then eventually, as we transitioned into this OXCOM program, it eventually replaced and became the state RACES program. Our program was set up in still invitation, and it's based on demonstrated performance during an exercise or activation, or at the recommendation of a county emergency manager. And oddly enough, and, and uh, really enough, I've had county emergency managers reach out to me and say, hey, these guys are doing a good job. Uh, we recommend that uh, they move up. And so we've had that happen and we continue to uh, support that today. We talked about the required uh, standardized ICS trainings and I'll, I'll go into detail a little more later about what those are. The OXCOM members must pass a state sponsored background check and they are cred credentialed by us and they become uh, part of the state races database. These volunteers are used to manage radios and equipment at the state EOC, as well as the equipment that is at ETV, the uh, flyaway kits in the trailer. These, these operators can also deploy in support of state communications unit missions. in 2012 once Oxcom kind of become a thing and as you can see in 2012 the Oxcom teams and state guards started hosting these and these meetings were of course with endorsement of EMD and ESF2. They were open to Oxcom state guard ESF2 state and federal partners with a focus on communications. These meetings were a consensus style format and eventually as we started growing and uh, things started progressing and changing, uh, those functions were transferred to EMD. And we'll talk about that here in just a second on the next slide. So in 2017, we transitioned to something called the South Carolina Communications Working Group. This lines up with the FEMA Region 4 and other region, regional working groups uh, at the uh, federal level. 
these working groups uh, replaced the previous OPSCOM meetings and it, it included more public safety and communications personnel from both the state and county level. Also, our federal, and partner, uh, federal partners were uh, invited and started showing up to that, FBI, uh, others. One thing I think that came out of the working group meetings, it definitely increased the relationship and partnerships that we had. Uh, it definitely strengthened our volunteer slash professional public safety folks relationship. That was a key. But one thing we wanted to do and one thing we did do was we kept the chairperson. The chairperson remained as an OXCOM volunteer. And I didn't put in the bullet point. These meetings we still do today, they're every month. We hold them at the uh, State Emergency Operations Center. And uh, I do publish those meeting min minutes and send them out to the group. Uh, we have grown over the years and now we include several counties, several municipi uh, municipalities, even a couple of fire departments, um, as well as uh, SWIC, ESF2, uh, DPS, DOT, and many others. So the, uh, the group has really turned into a uh, wonderful thing and, and it's a great place to coordinate and talk all things combo. So our current structure, what do we look like today? This is the slide I wanted to talk about because this is the, the difference. And when I said earlier, we still have ARIES and we have OXCOM. So how does that look? Well, ARIES is county managed and county focused. Basically, in a nutshell, what that means is the counties pretty much run their own ARIES programs. They decide how they're used. They decide the, uh, the training. They decide when they're going to call them in, when they're not going to call them in. They decide uh, where they're going to be in the EOCs, and they also help them support shelters and hospitals. Uh, each county has an emergency coordinator. Uh, that emergency coordinator works with their local county um, and they plan and support their communications. OSCOM is managed by us at EMD. They deploy state-owned asset, uh, assets. We do require specific ICS training. Uh, it does aug augment the state to calm you or e and ESF2 if needed. They operate the state radio room and they manage the SC Heart repeater network. It is key to point out here we have many folks who are at the same time so one of the biggest questions i get all the time is well does that pose a conflict and the answer is no because the way we structured it was if you're an aries member and you have dedicated yourself to a county and you're also in oxcom your county is first your county, your county is your primary responsibility. Meaning, if your county is being impacted by the disaster, that's where you're going to be. Uh, if your county is not impacted by the uh, disaster or incident, then you could potentially go to the state EOC or state equipment or a commune. So we, we always delineate that in our message, even to the county emergency managers. These are your guys first. These, these guys belong to you. If you need them, you call them, they'll come. If the county is not doing anything, uh, we will, if, and if they want to, we will use them in other places. Now, I also have folks who are just ARIES members. They, they don't want to really go around the state. They don't want to really go and do other things. They just want to help their county. And that's fine. Um, we, we take that because the counties need support too. So um, that's important. And I also on the flip side have folks that are just in OPSCOM. They, they don't necessarily want to work in a county, but they do want to work at the state level. They do want to get to do things um, with the radio room and or deploy equipment. So that's kind of how we have it structured. Um, Initially, there was some conflict, but we've since kind of worked all that out and explained to folks that, look, it doesn't matter. You, you, are, you do what you want to do, and you can do as little or as much as you choose. If you just want to go to county, that's acceptable. 
if you want to help the county but also help the state that's acceptable too if you want to just work with the state also acceptable. so kind of how we did it and it works out quite well again we talked about that so they are separate programs again you can be a member of both and one is state versus the other is county uh, it's important to note only OXCON members can operate state radio room and deployable assets uh, and one of the things I put down at the bottom of the slide that we are being on here and uh, and several others got me started on this about four years ago and it's kind of stuck with me. so uh, we like to not prefer uh, refer to our folks as ham radio operators we just don't want to do it we want to refer to them as professional communicators because in a sense that's what they're doing so um we we just the term ham radio operator I want these folks to know they're a part of something more than just a ham radio team. They're a part of Team South Carolina. They're a part of our commu. They're part of what we do. So with that, they're professional communicators. And uh, that's just kind of how we run it. So some of the expectations that we have on our side of the house, we ask that they uh, are a qualified group of trained operators that can support county, state, and or healthcare entities. Uh, it is also important to, to point out the healthcare facilities also do their own um, vetting and uh, entry processes and training processes for their folks. And usually our, our health department handles that side for uh, the volunteers. These members, you uh, we, we ask they meet all the training requirements set forth by the served agency. And uh, we'll talk about that in a second. We ask that they do attend training and exercise events and participate in activations. And most importantly, we ask that they work as an integrated communications team, regardless of their affiliation. If you show up to a commu and you're important to a commel, doesn't matter who you are, whether you're Aries, Oxcom, Civil Air Patrol, Mars, Racies, at that point, you are a professional communications volunteer assigned to the state communications unit. So affiliation really doesn't matter. And that's kind of our expectation. Um, and, and you, you know, you just have to be careful because some people will go, well, I'm in Aries or I'm in Oxcom. And I don't want to do that. We, that doesn't matter. It's irrelevant when you're coming to work as a team. SCMD also poorly trained, and this training for Aries and Oxcom members. Um, I do training in February, June, September, and November. Those are the months I do training. And our training always focuses on EOC, ESF2 operations. We train them for public safety communications in addition to ham radio. We train them, um, the Oxcom members get specialized training for shares. They get specialized training for other things. Now, I'm going to pause here and tell you that one of the things we're big on, especially with Oxcom, I want them to know how to use all the tools in the toolbox. So we do train them on public safety stuff. We train them on the 800 system. We train them on um, our low band system, which I'll talk about in a minute. We train them on satellite phones. We train them on those other things because we want them to really be diversified and not just limited to amateur radio. Yes, that is a part of what they can do, but they also can operate these uh, other pieces of equipment as well as shares. So shares is also in that, in that list. We also do provide access to the DHS training. And we do have an OXI class currently scheduled for next week. It is virtual. Uh, it's the 27th through the 9th. And I already have a full roster and several uh, back uh, on the ready reserve to go in there should somebody drop out. We have a goal to try to have all of our members uh, to complete this OXI course in the coming months and year or so. We're going to work on that. 
Uh, also, we have stronger plans now to cross train our OpsCon members on state deployable ESF2 assets. And uh, uh, we're, we're working through some training programs for that. So that's coming up too. So th these guys are, as you can tell, and as you can see, these guys are a real integral part of what we do in our state. Now, let's talk about the counties. We have a unique situation here in our state in the fact that we are a home rule state. So uh, at the state level, we really have no authority over individual counties. We do, of course, make recommendations, but the counties really can kind of set their own dynamics to this that they want. Um, and, and actually, in many cases, we have 46 counties in our state. And I think we have almost 46 different ways that Aries does business because each county is a little different in the kinds of things that they require. As, a, as an example, Florence County, uh, they like to require some additional training. And I think they're talking about implementing NCIC training for those folks at some point in the future. There's a couple of other counties that do ask for NCIC uh, training. There's some that ask for uh, basic uh, dispatch operations training. Even though these guys are not going to be dispatchers, many of them do work inside of a dispatch center. So the counties do have those kind of trainings. Counties do provide their own training and they can establish local requirements for their operators. Counties also establish their access requirements and credentialing process for their volunteers. Now, this first bullet point is very important because we do work closely with the counties. Any county that calls me and says, hey, will you help us with this training? I will absolutely do that. And we've done it before. And uh, I actually have some stuff set up with one of the counties now in the near future to provide some additional training to their operators. So we do assist the counties with that training initiative. But I just wanted to point out, it is important to remember the counties can establish their very own requirements and it doesn't have to be the same as the county next to them because they're all different. So with that being said, that does make it a little bit difficult here in our state. And that is one of the reasons we decided to keep the ARIES model and the OXCOM model separate. There was no way to try to manage with one pool of volunteers how we're going to do 46 different ways of training in addition to what the state's asking for. So we decided to do the ARIES model in there as well so that the counties could kind of manage that part of it and kind of create their own requirements. Now, some of them actually, there's, there's several counties that do actually just require them to just become OXCOM members. That's their requirement. Uh, so and they have that right, they can do that. Uh, so, another thing EMD we tried, we tried, we started it back in 2018. And uh, now we're trying to do these every year and we did one in 19. We skipped 20 because of, actually no, I take that back, we did not skip 20. We had a small uh, communications ex exercise in the beginning of 20 before COVID started. Uh, but we just had a big exercise back in April this year, and uh, we are looking now for sure to make that a yearly thing. And these exercises are open to all ARIES, RATCs, OXCOM, and the general amateur radio community. All counties are encouraged to engage their uh, local teams and their EOCs to support these exercises. And we almost always deploy state and local assets in support of these exercises. So. That program has grown. Uh, we've grown that program tremendously. Uh, every year we do this from 2019 to just this past April, our exercises are getting bigger and better. And uh, as everybody knows, Rome wasn't built in a day and it just takes time, but we see the trends. We see the trends happening and it's just been a great, uh, great feeling to see that moving in a positive direction. So one of the things I wanted to bring up in this was kind of tell you kind of what we have here in our state available to us for communications. So the first thing we have, we have our Palmetto 800 system. 
This system is, of course, a phase one P25 system, and we are transfer, uh, transitioning to phase two later in 2025 to 2027. And that system does serve as our primary, primary public safety system in the state. And of course, it does provide statewide coverage. There are over 800 uh, entities that should be uh, agencies, not users, on the system. There's about 50,000 individual users on the system. It's one of the largest in the country. And obviously, it is primary for public safety. And that is a coverage map this map is old. It gives you a general idea. We have added quite a number of sites since this uh, map was published, but just a general gist. We also have the conventional 800 system, which is a uh, network that utilizes state and national interoperability frequencies. And there is at least one of these in every county, but in many cases, there's two to three in, in a county. Um, these are not normally linked. They are normally standalone repeaters, but they can be used for interoperability and mutual aid. They are conventional, they're not digital. Um, and they, it's a cost-effective interoperability solution. And one thing I say about John, one of the things I absolutely love about what they've done, this system came about, they created state standard templates to uh, program in the radios. And that was an amazing thing because what that did, that allowed everybody to have access to the mutual aid channels, both on the network, the PAL-8 network. It allowed all of these conventional 800 repeaters to be in there as well as some simplex interop channels. So every radio in our state that's programmed, hopefully with the state standard template, has those channels pre-programmed in there. So no matter whether you're working with a sheriff's department on the coast or a police department in the upstate or a state agency, you pick a radio up and all of those mutual aid channels are pre-programmed into the radio for you. I think that is a great way of doing it, and it ensures that no matter what, you've got true interoperability, and that does help us out quite a bit. And again, this is an additional network that can uh, handle some capacity during events or emergencies. And I know several counties that actually use their uh, conventional repeater to augment communications for like festivals and stuff. And we do train our operators, our volunteers to use this system. We train them where these repeaters are how to use them and what those frequencies are, because many times we have these volunteers that are supporting these festivals for a municipality or a county. And so they're many times helping with communications. So they, use, they know how to use that. So going on there. In addition to that, END also operates a low band system in the state. This system is offered to all the counties. Each county has a radio available in their EOC. Uh, some even have it in their dispatch. And this is designed to provide a third level of redundancy to the, to the counties, um, just to make sure we have coverage. Reason we decided to keep this, it's low cost, relatively easy technology. And with low band, we are really covering the whole state with about 12 repeaters. So it didn't cost a lot of money to do. It was a great idea to, uh, it's been in place for years, but when I got hired on in 2015, the system was somewhat in disrepair. So we kind of went out and started fixing it up. And I brought that up because I wanted to say the volunteers, the Oxcom volunteers were key in that. Many of them spent many hours uh, helping us, many of them, actually even built out complete repeaters. In some cases, actually took and put those on the air. So I will tell you one of the benefits of having the volunteers, especially for me, I'm just one person. Dennis and our ESS2 lead, he's, he's got just one other person with him and, and they have a third um, who has other duties, but he can help them some we do not have the manpower to do a lot of stuff by ourselves and having the volunteers that are willing, able to come in and do this stuff has just been an amazing uh, life-saving effort for us uh, we could not do it without them 
and I'm sure Bob would back me up on that. It's just been having them to help us with this stuff has been just unbelievably helpful. I just wanted to point that out. The coverage of the event, I showed you where we are with that. And since it was made, I added a site in Conway, and we are preparing to add a site in Greenwood to fill in a few gaps that we have with that system. Each county also has access to satellite push to talk radios. These push to talk radios are monitored by our state warning point 24 hours a day. And this is yet another layer of redundant communications and another layer that the Oxcom volunteers and some Aries, because lots of counties have trained their Aries members on this stuff too. They all know how to use this stuff. The goal is, is to have the volunteers, doesn't matter how they get the message to us, could be amateur radio, could be ODR, could be 800. It doesn't matter as long as traffic gets passed to us. So that was kind of why we went and trained them to do more than just the amateur radio. Obviously, this system is satellite based. The, this system, some of the units also can act as a satellite telephone, but some of them are just push to talk radios. That depends upon the specific county. Then we talk about amateur radio, so that's just a vo uh, volunteer augmentation force multiplier. And down at the bottom, you can see our minimum training standards for Oxcom, and that is ICS 100, 200, 700, and 800. And that is just the base. That's just to get accepted into the database and start uh, getting additional training. That's in addition to the background check too. And this kind of spells out what I was talking about earlier, just kind of ARI supports the county and local agencies, as well as shelters and hospitals, races and Oxcom, uh, do state agency stuff. Our SD heart system, I did where those repeaters are. This is the analog system. This is not the DMR, uh, but this is our analog system. And you can see that most all the sites have both a VHF and a UHF. Most of you know that South Carolina has gotten short in the stick when it's come to disasters. And South Carolina is a unique state in that we face many types of disasters, from tornadoes to wildfires to hurricanes and anything in between to include flooding. And we've had our share of flooding since 2015. I don't have an exact total, but if you added up all the volunteer hours our volunteers have put in over the past five years, it would be in the thousands and thousands of hours. Um, it just really would. And I'll give you a prime example. During Hurricane Florence in 2018, our radio room was staffed nonstop for three and a half weeks, uh, 24 by seven, all volunteers. So that activation alone was many, many, many hours. Uh, in addition to that, we had folks staffed in there during the floods in 2015, and that was about two weeks we had uh had them in there for dorian and that was probably about a week and a half maybe just under a week and a half we've had them in there for severe weather days for skywarn um those activations only last for one day usually if it's bad weather uh, they just come in for the one day um we've had them for uh, many other things they also supported the solar eclipse in 2017 uh, we had them uh, stand up for that. Uh, and not to mention the exercises. We've done plenty of those, and, and these guys have really been a tremendous part of that as well. Also, in the past five years, we had the uh, creation of the SEEK, or the Statewide Interoperability Executive Committee, that uh, is part a subcommittee of our Homeland Security Advisory Council that is governed by SLED and is chaired by uh, our SWIC, Bob Stedman. And, uh, Moving with our trend for the volunteers, we decided we had to have one of the uh, 
members of OXCOM. So the SEEK does have a voting member from the OXCOM program that is a part of our SEEK. Um, the other thing that we really have, have identified in the past five years is we, we've really seen an increased need of communications personnel. This is due to a number of things, attrition, uh, retirement, people moving to other places, just lots of different things. And so uh, we've kind of been hit hard in the comms field, but we've got a lot of superstars rising up through the ranks now uh, that are coming out. And that's kind of why I put that in there. We just needed, we saw that increased need. Cool another thing is uh, our ESF2 lead, uh, Dennison, recently, uh, as within the past few days, added the uh, OXCOM group to Bridge for Public Safety, which is a online web portal that allows everybody to log in and, and it's kind of like a chat function where you can type in a app and everybody sees it. Um, he had one created for ESF2 group uh, for about a year and a half now. And we have since added Oxcom to that uh, just this past week. What about exercises earlier, but the two big ones that we've done were 2019 and 2021. And I wanted to put these two on here to show you kind of the growth that we've seen between the two years. The uh, original exercise we did in 2019 at the time was the largest statewide communications exercise we had had in many, many years. And we had over 50% or right at 50% of our counties represented. And we had 17% of the EOCs stood up to support that. We had roughly 100 volunteers. We did one in April of 2021, just a few months back. And for that one, we had 72% of our counties that were represented. 30% of the EOCs were activated and we were up to about 140, maybe 150 uh, volunteers. And in addition to that, ESF2 put on a wonderful uh, exercise out at the Fire Academy that integrated the OXCOM folks into a state commu team. And they also supported uh, instant tactical dispatch and several other things. And that was the first kind of time we had that. We're going to that team move more of it. Just put that on. You could really see where we where we kind of came from. And I won't bore you, but. If you go back to 2018 and 2017 and 2016, the numbers, uh, percentages of counties that were represented back then were kind of abysmal. Um, we, we've come a long ways. And uh, to say 72% of our counties were represented in an exercise, that, that's really unprecedented for us. And it, But it does show we're moving in the right direction. Um, and as a side effect of this, since the exercise of April, I have had three additional counties who have not been active in the amateur radio world contact me and say, hey, I want to get involved. So that 30%, that's only going to continue to grow and we're going to continue to support these counties as they come on board and decide to grow their programs. So I'm almost done, but I want to talk about some things that we're looking at moving forward. We do want to increase our volunteer participation even more, uh, specifically at the uh, state and local levels. We are definitely working toward better integration of our OXCOM folks into our commu program. That's been happening, and that start was the uh, exercise that Dennison held at the Fire Academy in April. That, that, that one part has kind of helped that spur off. We are also looking at additional training incentives such as working with ESF2 and others. Um, the other thing I'm looking at doing is getting Civil Air Patrol more involved and cross train because we don't do a lot of that. So we're looking at that part. Um, and again, we're focused on program growth for the state and county levels. Uh, we're focused on growing our ARIES program in the counties. And uh, we're also developing in-state training capabilities so that we can do more of the classes uh, for COM, L, COM, T, and OXCOM. So those are things we're really working forward. Uh, and uh, 
kind of how we are today. So any questions, and I can go back and cover anything if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to ask them. Um, I want to say I was glad to come and share this, and, and maybe if this can help you and, and kind of where you are, what state you're working in to better grow your program and move forward, then I hope it does. Because that's one of the things I really wanted to do was I, I don't want to be selfish. I don't want to share what, keep what we're doing here in South Carolina to ourselves. I want to share it so others can be as, as successful as, as we have been here uh, as of late. So, but I, I do want to thank our volunteers, Roger, Gary, uh, I saw a few others on here, George Mudd, uh, Pete, Ed Knowles, several that's logged in here tonight. And if I missed, sorry, there's a lot of folks I didn't see, but we have so many to name. I can't probably thank them enough uh, for the things that they do and the things that they do to us in support of our mission. And uh, really, um, I thank the good Lord above that he's blessed this state and, and us with such wonderful people that are willing to get out there and, and get in the grind with us. No questions asked. So are there any questions? Um, hey, would you drop your screen there? Um, yes. Share screen. Yeah, thank you. Gabe, thank you very much. That was excellent. Thank you, Steve, for having me. Uh, like I said, I just, I, if I can help somebody and, and give them some guidance, I recognize this isn't a one size fits all. Every state's different. Everybody has different ways of doing things. Ours is different because of our situation being a home rule state. So we had to kind of structure it a little different. But the big thing I try to tell people, especially uh, county emergency managers who are considering using uh, volunteers for the first time. Always remember, these guys are great. They can provide a lot, a lot of manpower for you. A lot of things that these guys can do. And the best thing is they don't cost a dime. They're free because they're volunteers. They don't cost anybody anything. So, you know, that, that's states that, that are still kind of looking at using it. If you're a state out there that's looking at that, I, absolutely. I, I couldn't speak high enough about it. It, it. You're missing out if you don't. Gabe, I think there's a bunch of questions on chat. And I think uh, okay. Dan has a, a, a method for handling that. I do. I do. Okay. Uh, Barry, are you there? Hello, Barry. I would like to remind people if they want to uh, get our attention to uh, raise the hand. All they have to do is, uh, like I said earlier, raise your hand through that re reactions button. I just got my hand raised. Now I can lower it again. Okay, Barry, are you there? I'm not. Uh, he's not for some reason or another. Um, I tell you what, uh, uh, Steve, do you want to pick up the uh, reading the questions there? He might make a, make a, make a little more sense. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes. Um, okay, it's, it goes way back here. Hold on just a second. How, uh, Laura Cutchins in uh, North Carolina wants to know, how is liability insurance handled in the state of South Carolina? Counties and it's, is it consistent? The short answer to that is that's something that we still struggle with. That's something I think everybody struggles with when it comes to volunteers. Um, generally speaking, at the county level, they they usually assume the liability for those folks that's working at the county level. Um, we do assume liability for the folks that work directly at our facility uh, at EMD. Uh, there is initiatives through our uh, Emergency Management Association right now. Matter of fact, this was on the docket just last week to push legislation up to the legislatures to help address that because that's been one spot that we've kind of struggled with over the years. Uh, and still to this day, 
depending upon who you ask here, nobody can give you a straight answer. But I, I have a feeling that we're not the only state that has that problem. I think that's uh, common across the country. Yeah, it's a, it's a home rule state. So uh, the other question about that was workers comp at the state level. So they do not, we do not currently have workmen's comp, but so for instance, if they're working at EMD, uh, they are covered through us. Um, I don't know what the coverage limits are on that, but uh, there is stuff that can help them out. Okay, the, well, uh, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. The, the issue we faced, and we haven't had an issue with, uh, the folks that deploy out in the field. And again, um, we're, we're still working to try to get clarification to that process. And uh, Bob, if you're still on here, if you maybe you have some knowledge to that that's a little more than what I have, but uh, I think collaboratively, we we just were working through that process. And like I said, I've talked to other states and I hear the same thing from them, but Bob or Roger, do you have anything to add to that? Hey, Gabe. Uh, You're right, Gabe. But... Go ahead, Bob. <laughs> Gabe, you're right. It's uh, being talked about, but there are no uh, concrete solutions yet. So hopefully the work the scheme is doing will uh, help find a solution. You know, Gabe, I was just going to say, I was talking to your legal uh, specialist yesterday. And uh, essentially at EMD, you're covered like any other citizen if there's an accident, but there is no workman's comp for any volunteer working for the state. Now, some of the counties have gotten by that by creating a rescue squad for communications type things or volunteer fireman communications act, which the state has. And some counties are doing that, but there is nothing at the state level, but it is being worked on. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, WA zero uh, QIG in Iowa uh, wants to know how do you activate OxCom? So our process for that is once we see at the state level that there's something potentially going on, I will usually notify Roger. Uh, Roger is our uh, DEC for the uh, state EOC. He's our coordinator for that. I usually notify him that, hey, there's something coming up, uh, maybe a storm potentially or whatever the case, and typically he'll send an email out to everybody to let them know and give them a heads up. Now that we've added them to Bridge for Public Safety, that part will allow you to just type a message in there and it goes out to the whole group. That's kind of one of the reasons we kind of started moving in that direction. And then once we do have an activation order or we see, hey, we're definitely going to have an activation, I will call Roger and say, hey, we're going to have an activation starting on Saturday. And then he starts making schedules and kind of getting prepped for who's going to be coming in there to uh, support. Um, and then also puts everybody else on standby, letting them know. And then our, our state, uh, our state emergency coordinator for Aries, he does the same for the Aries folks. And also in addition to that, we also host uh, coordination calls from EMD with all the volunteers. Uh, to advise them of what's going on. Uh, generally, I start sending those out. So, for instance, if a hurricane, we see something coming and we're going to have to activate. Let's say today's Thursday. We see we might have to stand up possibly Sunday. On Sunday afternoon, I would initiate a call to or a conference call for Aries and Oxcom folks, and I would then brief them on the situation. Situation. Okay, thank you. Are you still there? Because you were fading a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Uh, next question is from Bill K2 COP. Does South Carolina Division of Emergency Management address MCOM needs during declared ESF 6 activation deployments? So the answer to that question is it depends, but mostly that's going to be at the county level because our ESF sit does the shelter options and shelters are generally managed by the county, not the state. And so if there's a need now, if they need, we, we have had situations in the past 
where a county doesn't have enough of its own areas folks to support that mission and they will put a resource for additional volunteers to help augment that. Well, we typically don't get okay the next uh, next question is uh what task book do you use of course that depends on what course you're uh, uh you know i know you use oxcom uh, i know you use uh the task book for coml and com t do you use any others we uh so our seek we have established a position task book sub uh, we are actually currently in the process of getting all that set up uh, the task books we use they're the standard uh, formats that come from uh, FEMA and DHS uh, we add neat things to our COMEL and OXCOM task book that are specific to our state like the shares stuff especially for OXCOM so our OXCOM task book will be the states the, the national standard but it will have a couple of things that state specific added to it. Um, and Bob, do you have any other info on what uh, other task books? I know we did that for Oxcom and Comil. Right, we adopted the Seek adopted the uh, FEMA approved uh, position task books for all Bob, positions. Bob, while you have it, can you explain what a home rule state is? That was the a question. home rule state. Me basically it, uh, the counties have uh, autonomy and cannot be forced to take any action they don't want to take thank you um there are some states where state employees are in the counties and that's not true of uh, most states but there are some states that way and bob uh, uh any for noc in north carolina wants to know he's curious if there's a mechanism to utilize volunteers for neighboring states when needed, EMAC. Right, we would use the uh, EMAC process. We'd actually go into the system, the EMAC system, the Emergency Management Assistance Compact system and put out a request. But tip, typically the way that most of the EMAC requests go is you already have a relationship with those agencies or those uh, responsibilities or assets that you need in your neighboring states. For us, it's North Carolina, Georgia and we would reach out personally and say hey look heads up we need your help and the emac process is kind of a formality to ensure that fema funding or reimbursement can be completed after the uh, incident but typically uh, the responses are done it would be either gabe roger or, or others reaching out to the the uh, neighbors saying hey look we we have a need and that they would respond and then the emac is just the uh, official stamp of approval for FEMA reimbursement. Yeah, that, 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 that's an incomplete answer. Don't forget about Tennessee. <laughs> I, I apologize because Tennessee has <laughs> responded to many of our events, including the major flooding in 2015. You're exactly right, Steve. Uh, it said uh, uh, Dennis uh, W7DKL wants to know, do you use software such as Web EOC to manage events? So, Steve, yes, we do. Um, we initially started off with Web EOC. <laughs> what happened? Sorry about that. Um, we did use Web EOC for a while. We transitioned in 18 to uh, another uh, software called Palmetta. And a lot like Web EOC, but it's built more with the state in mind has a lot more graphical orders and it's a complete common operating picture that we use. Uh, so we do use that. And all the resource requests, resource tracking, stuff like you would do through Web EOC. Well, thank you. Uh, Gabe, uh, Bob, and Roger, this was terrific. Thank you very much for taking the time to help educate us. Um, Hopefully we got a lot out of it. It's been recorded. I have no idea what that means, but uh, it'll be, I guarantee you, it will be, uh, uh, it will be distributed. Um, Dan, uh, I guess that's it. Thank you. Okay, I, I will get this recording uh, uh, posted so we can send it out to everybody. 
some of you who got here who know where somebody else told somebody who told somebody about it. So if you're in that situation, go back through that link and, and be sure to get the uh, the follow I call it the follow up email that has a link to this video. Also, like to have anybody who's got some uh, suggestions and such regarding what we're doing tonight. I can comment. So get a hold of Steve or I. Uh, we're trying to move this thing forward. I think we have a good thing for everybody, and we want to make it that way. With that, I'm going to ask again if there's any questions out there. Just to make a comment, the next Thursday night is uh, North Carolina Emergency Management, the sister state of the Carolinas, and uh, it's a totally different but just as effective show. So hopefully uh, we'll learn something there also. Steve, I want to say thank you again for inviting me for having me. Honor to show tonight. Hey, Gabe, it's our it's our honor. Uh, the purpose of this series is so that we can understand what it is that's required of us and how we implement uh, our bodies as we move forward, trying to get involved with MCOM, uh, with the uh, authorities having jurisdiction in their critical infrastructure partners and uh, thank you for being one of the best no problem thank you i noticed that tom w3 pdh has got his hand up you want to uh, come in there tom and ask your question hello tom there you go no he's trying to unmute okay so i just noticed this in the chat there's a question in the chat uh about who pays for the background checks that you mentioned and i don't know who put it in there but i didn't hear it since so so we do our background checks through sled and typically they don't charge us but if they do any charges we do incur emd will pay that mm -hmm. since we're sponsoring the group but typically typically i don't think sled charges us for the background checks that we do because we just do a check through them and also if folks already have like a CWP or they're a law enforcement officer uh, current uh, law enforcement officer or any of the security with uh, background vetting we just we don't require it we just go off of that because obviously if you have a CWP that's recent you obviously don't have any attached to you okay uh, Dan I call him Little D Dan, and that's because he always types his name with a little D, and I'm capital D Dan, I guess. So, Little D Dan, go ahead, take it. Oh, Gabe, I kind of made this question up because I wanted to thank you for doing such a great job and uh, sharing how an organic system can evolve that really does meet the state's needs and uh, make the best use of available amateur resources. So, kudos to the lot of you. Um, and the question is, in Stafford Act incidents where reimbursement is involved, do the OXCOM volunteers earn their 24 and a half bucks an hour as offsets to the 75% uh, FEMA funding? That is correct. We track their hours and that money is reimbursed back to the state. That, that's one thing all 50 states have in common. And other than that, I think every state's example is going to have its own variances. So thanks a lot. This really was a great presentation. Thank you. It really was. And uh, we, we, right now we've got uh, some people in you know, Tennessee and South Carolina and such. And as we go through the series, we're going to be taking up some of the states and uh, stuff on the West Coast. It's going to be interesting to see how different people are doing things and, and their organizations. And I think we all have something good to learn that from this. All right, is there any other comments? Just Questions? thank you again for giving us this opportunity. Yes, yes, very much so. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I hope that we can be uh, hooked up like this again and that uh, you will join us with our future presentations here. Well, I'll, I'll shut the thing down and get busy uh, getting this all available to you guys. So thanks again for showing up. Steve, thank you for your part. You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for... Uh setting it up for us. Thank you very much.